For our first entry, we'll be observing a Redditor spiral into madness, so to speak. The user is basically having an existential crisis. It seems that his madness started around February 2017 with this post. The theory of quantum immortality has driven me to a really dark place. I'm living in a state of pure terror. Is there reason not to believe it is true? Can it be debunked? User AFH43 posted this same concern on several different subreddits, but it never really caught on and they never received a satisfying answer. One of the other posts said, The theory of quantum immortality has driven me to a state of pure anxiety and terror over the last week. Is it true? Has it been debunked? I can't do this anymore. A user named John Hassler replied with the following, Quantum immortality just means that you will never wake up dead. Think about it. The only state you will ever observe yourself to be in is alive. That's only one of the problems with it. Another is that death is not an instantaneous quantum transition. It's a slow, messy process by which the collection of atoms that you are currently pleased to call me becomes so disorganized as to be unable to call themselves anything and then begin to stink. You will likely be there for much of the process and know what is happening. Don't worry, you are in no danger of being forced to live forever against your own will. OP would go on to ask John if his statement would make the theory illegitimate, which prompted the following comment. What do you think you are? Why do you think that death, which is just another macroscopic physical process like spraining your ankle, will create some sort of continuity between you and one, but only one, of the myriad states of the universe in which you do not die? And what about the past states in which you did die? Did they all somehow coalesce into you? The line of reasoning that leads you to believe that you will live forever, quantum immortality, must also lead to the conclusion that you will die forever. If you're asking yourself what quantum immortality even is right now, it gets very convoluted and like with most thought experiments, I just get really effing confused. So I'm going to read this example word for word as it's probably the easiest way to understand it. So there's this device that goes off every few seconds and when it does, the universe will either cease to exist, which would mean you're dead or nothing happens, meaning you're alive. So each time the device triggers, the universe splits, and there is one version of you that is dead and another where you're still alive. But in the version that you are dead, you won't know that you're dead. Only the version of you that survived knows that you lived, so you're considered immortal. And maybe I'm just too smooth brain for this, but it just seems like a pointless thought to me. Anyway, OP is terrified at the thought that he possibly can never die. And from that initial post onwards, OP's account has nothing but conversations revolving around quantum immortality. Over the span of about half a week, OP made about a dozen posts about the same topic. Then on February 6th of the same year, they make this post. Quantum immortality. I'm taking my own life soon. It's too much. I can't do it anymore. Afterwards, there would be no activity on his account, so it seemed like the guy really went through with it. Either that, or this entire rabbit hole was a hoax. But fast forward to 2019, it seems like AFH is still alive. In r slash relationship advice, AFH resurfaced and made the following post. While recovering from a psychotic breakdown slash attempt, I met the only girl I have ever fallen in love with. Due to my state, it didn't work out. I am considering asking her out again. I am AFH43, a regular feature on those dark slash creepy reddit history threads. I am still alive. It's been a long time since I have logged into this account. I thought it had been long forgotten by everyone. However, after logging in a few days ago, I saw that my inbox was full of hundreds of messages from people asking how I am, or whether I am even alive. I also saw that my username had been mentioned in a lot of dark, creepy reddit history ask reddit posts. These were extremely hard for me to read because I try not to think about that time in my life. Nearly three years ago, I woke up one morning and my mind simply broke. I believe that because of quantum immortality, I would never be able to die and therefore would experience all of the greatest sufferings possible over and over again for all eternity. I felt there was no escape. It was like a panic attack of the highest intensity that did not end for weeks. For the first time, I understood what Emil Charan meant when he said, We dread the future only when we are not sure we can end it when we want to. Surviving a 
attempt only worsened my delusions. It was only once I started on medication during my stay in a psych ward that I began to put the pieces of my life back together and return to normality. It was during the process of getting back on my feet that I met a girl whom I completely fell for. We went on a few dates, we even kissed, but because of what I was going through, I was so nervous around her that it made things a bit awkward and I was very much emotionally closed up. I think I just tried too hard to make something happen, I just wasn't ready. I was still recovering from a truly traumatic and horrific experience that had completely shattered my mind. I only really started to become myself, to come out of my shell, after we stopped seeing each other and I began my first relationship with another girl. My girlfriend was a pretty incredible person and over the last year with her, I learned to enjoy life, to become free and uninhibited by anxieties. I became open, I became comfortable with myself and who I was and with the constraints on my existence. I made peace with my experience with my delusions. Today I am happy and in control of my life, truly. So all in all, OP seems to be in a pretty good mental state right now. He even says that he is happy. However, this wouldn't last long as in 2022, AFH made another post updating followers about his life. I'm still here. For a few years, my life has been pretty good, but at the moment I'm having an unrelated breakdown and I'm in the hospital for other mental reasons. I wish I could end it, but I'm still too scared. Maybe it's worth facing it though. I'll have to face death eventually. I'm stuck in hell and my life is effed. I might turn to other things to have some relief from this relentless pain. I just need to sleep and never wake up. Maybe that could be my reality. I just can't do this. I feel alone. I'm terrified and numb at the same time. The default state of my life is suffering. If anyone can dissuade me from quantum immortality, please tell me, but please don't make it worse for me. I'm in agony. Nothingness is a beautiful thing. I just want out. I know it will transfer the pain to other people and that makes me feel horrible. I wish I didn't have these beliefs. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here right now. Since my last post, I've been diagnosed with OCD and that explains a lot. I've been given Seroquel today to help me start thinking rationally. This may sound stupid, but this situation has to do with heartbreak and very specific and absurd triggering factors related to it. Maybe that sounds stupid, but I found love, real love, and now it might be over. Life is suffering. I am suffering. I don't want to be here anymore. I wish this was physical pain instead. I really envy Emil Charon. It was a wonderful fantasy to him at times, because at any moment he knew he could escape and that gave him immense comfort. My mind is broken and I don't think I'll ever be able to fix it. This next entry was created in January of 2019 by user tbug411. They stated that when staying at a hotel, a woman had made her way into their room through a hole that was hidden behind a mirror. The post itself was titled, Florida woman crawled out of my hotel mirror to rob me. This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms and as we stood outside of our rooms, I opened mine and I saw someone in the bathroom. I said, hello. Nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there for some reason. And then I saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. I said to my coworker, there's a woman in my room. Then I asked the woman, what are you doing with my stuff? It gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything I said and what she said, but she kept mumbling about how her key still worked, how it still worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time, my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. This woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and I said, what's in the bag? Thinking it is probably my stuff and so she said, no, no, it's just my things. It's just my things. I'll show you. And so she did. I looked and I didn't see anything of mine and so I'm obviously in shock at this time. I let her leave. I went into my room and it's been ransacked. I did a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. Then I went into the bathroom 
bathroom and I saw my underwear, my bikini, and my clothes shoved into my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there. Then I looked on the counter and I saw that she got into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at the moment other than I wanted it back. So I ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out to the sides of the hotel and I didn't see her. I realized I was never going to find her, so my coworker and I went down to the lobby to tell them what happened and then we called the police. We went back up to my room to wait and I noticed that there is a metal bat on my bed a little larger than one of those novelty wooden bats you can get at a baseball game but there's also a flashlight on the end. She must have left it behind in her hurry. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point because I thought that she'd gotten away with my medication that I need. The police got there and took our statements and looked around the room as well. One thing that I noticed was that there were bits of drywall in the sink and I pointed that out to the cops but none of us really knew where it came from. We started looking at the door and the windows to see if she pried her way in somehow but there was nothing. Thing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something, even though the hotel front desk was adamant that there's no way that could be. The officer that came brought two more officers as backup because they thought that the woman might still be in the vicinity, but after our statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people, and as I'm on the phone, I'm thinking about the drywall in the sink and it still didn't make sense to me. So I'm on the phone and looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right above it. And then it hit me. I got my coworker and asked her to help me pull at this mirror on the wall. And we took the mirror down and there's a hole there just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know that I found this and my boss said there's still two cop cars in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them and the female cop kinda rolled her eyes but the young guy said I'll come check it out. They both came back up, looked in the hole, and found a pillow, blankets, cigarettes, clothes, toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for god knows how long. She had access to me and my room at all times. I know it might be hard to picture, there was a crawl space about 2 feet wide in between the two rows of rooms. One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to him what's going on and all I hear over the radio is no effing way. He comes back, takes pictures, and is just as mind blown as the rest of us. Obviously, we packed up and left immediately. What's even crazier is she has probably been there a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel, I would randomly smell cigarette smoke and I assumed someone was smoking in their bathroom and it was traveling through the vents. But nope, a junkie was smoking just on the other side of my mirror. She had access to other rooms too. The holes in the walls were from a renovation and the hotel hadn't properly patched and just covered up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in people's rooms when they were gone. Anyway, this was insane and I'm taking a little time off. Posting from mobile, so sorry if the formatting is off. If you're like the millions of people around the world that has caffeine in their daily life, check out partner of the channel, Gamersups. They have a wide array of amazing flavors and each serving is less than 40 cents with my code DLAM which gives you 10% off your order. Some of my personal favorites are Titty Milk and Guacamole Gamer Farts. It also supports the channel so if you're interested, check out the first link in the description. Now back to the video. This entry focuses on a reddit user named Cash22, an account which has been banned. The person behind this account took to reddit to share his desire to be with someone. This attraction gets out of hand and, well, it's probably easier to explain if I just read his posts. Cash22 initially drew concern when this post was made in r slash confessions. I spy on my soulmate. As long as they have their phone on them, they go to the store, I can see. They're at home, I can see. I check very often, seeing where they are. I just like to feel close to them, even when we are not physically close. And I like to think about what they're doing. The only downside is I can't see them. 
Sometimes I think I want to make them a plushie and hide cameras in their eyes so that in their bedroom I can see them sleep. But I'm worried that they may get changed there. If they do and then find out I put cameras there, they'd feel like I spied on something too personal, even though it isn't my intent. And I want to lock them up in a cage in the basement, also lined with cameras, so I can watch them when I'm busy, they're so cute. Another post titled, I want to keep my partner locked up in my basement, said, I began cataloging my partner's interests and aesthetic choices more than usual because we started making plans to move out together because I want to make a safe haven for them in the basement. I'm not going to lock them up against their will and, of course, we are going to share a normal bed together like any couple. I know which carpet they have in their current room, their favorite brands of consumables, the media they're a fan of, and their favorite favorite plushies. Just to keep them safe from the outdoor world if I have to go away to work and can't bring them. I would love to hire them eventually so we don't have to be apart but I kind of have my business on the back burner right now. It's not very big slash active. Let them stay in there, locked safely with cameras so I can be sure they're okay and they can have fun while being safe. They can text me too, keep their phone and everything. I'm not interested in controlling their entire life. I know it's probably weird, but I just want to keep them safe to the point where I think about this almost constantly. So OP is definitely unwell, and it gets even darker when he shares that he plans to actually kidnap his so-called partner. I have a strong desire to kidnap my partner. I can't sleep sometimes because it bothers me that they're not with me. Whenever they do anything when I'm not there, I don't stop them because I respect their autonomy. I have the urge to just lock them away from the world in a containment room slash chamber slash cage so that I can always have them to myself. When they tell me about things they want or enjoy having, my brain sometimes drifts away to thoughts of how to implement these things in my own space so that I can hold them captive here in a way that would be least painful for them. I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I am obsessed with the idea. It's constantly on my mind and hard to ignore, but I don't want to do this to hurt them, just to keep and protect them. I'm extremely obsessed with my partner. I think about them all the time, to the extent where it's hard for me to sleep or work when they're not there, because I think about them and the things I'd like to do with them so much. I've had a crush on this person for over a decade, and I'm happy that we finally started dating, but I feel like it's making me go insane. I constantly think about locking them up. I feel feel ill when they're not talking to me, especially when they're awake. I feel an intense need to protect them. I hate their friends. I hate anything that keeps them from me at any point on either end. I want to marry them so badly, but we haven't even been on our first proper date yet, despite being an item for months now. They told me they weren't really into the idea of marriage, but another time, I accidentally referred to myself as their husband instead of boyfriend, and they ignored it, so maybe they're more more open to it. I don't know, but either way, it's something I think about constantly. There are many people who stumble upon this account and believe OP to be some sort of troll. However, if this was true, the person behind the account is extremely dedicated, as the post that we just went over is a small fraction of what he shared. OP talked about this unhealthy fondness towards their partner several times a day on Reddit, and he did this for weeks on end. This post was created back in early 2018 by user FYourCoconut. It was made on r slash JustKnowMIL, which is a subreddit with about 2 million members dedicated to discussing issues people are having with their mother or mother-in-law. The sub itself says, It's a place to post about your MIL or mother who is just the worst. Come for support, come for advice, or just a vent and get it all out. That's what we're here for. This post states that OP's mother had inadvertently killed one of their kids via the use of coconut oil. Hello, I am a first time poster, but I discovered this subreddit a few months ago. I was talking about this subreddit with my therapist and she gave me the homework of speaking out more about my story to see if it lessened my pain. I've written and deleted this post maybe 7 times now, but I think it's time to get it out. I've spoken English for 30 years, but it's not my first language and occasionally I use the wrong word because that's what the direct translation is, so I apologize in advance if I confuse anyone. 
one. This is going to be a long post as I'm a rambler and there is a lot of background involved. Trigger warning, a mother-in-law who doesn't believe in allergies and the price I paid for it, child death. This happened 12 years, 2 months, and 13 days ago on Wednesday, November 2nd, 2005. My DH got married in 2002 and had our son 10 months later in the same year. In May 2004, we welcomed our twin girls. My family was beautiful. Every time I took a picture of us, we looked like the families in the stock photos you can google for. My DH is an engineer and I'm a college professor. We had a nice house in the city. Our children were healthy and happy. We even had a golden retriever named Argo as if we weren't the picture of familial happiness as is. I can no longer look at the pictures of us because it makes me too angry too. When my twin girls were born, we had no issues in the hospital. They were born right on their due date, latched perfectly, and passed all their postnatal tests with stellar stats. When we brought them home, however, we noticed that one of the girls was developing a rash. Let's call her OD since she was a whole four and a half minutes older than her sister. I hadn't really dealt with allergies in kids since my son didn't have them and neither did any child or adult in my entire family. I wasn't sure what it was. I thought that maybe she just had sensitive skin like me. I can't tolerate certain fabrics because I have very dry skin and I'll often break out in rashes if my skin decides that it doesn't like something. So I stopped using fabric softener on all the clothes. I bought the nicest, most comfortable bedding and clothing. At one point, I even made her clothes myself in the fear that maybe something in the manufacturing process was upsetting my OD. We went to the doctor several times and they knew that she was having an allergic reaction to something, but every test came back negative and we couldn't figure out what it was. It took three more months to figure it out. During that time, her allergic reactions got more and more severe. At one point, she was the only baby in the history of the hospital who had to be kept in a clean room because she seemed to have have a reaction the minute she left. When that happened, we began an elimination therapy that would rival the lifestyle of Buddhist monks. My husband and I moved our son and YD in with his parents because we needed to eliminate everything from our routine to figure out what was causing the reaction in our OD. We stopped using our soap, our shampoo, our deodorants, our laundry detergents, and that was before we even got to our diet. It took us three more months, but we figured it out. Our OD was allergic to coconut. The doctors told us that it was a particularly rare allergen and so it wasn't on any of the skin test panels they ran. When we found out what she was allergic to, we were relieved. So, so relieved. But in addition to feeling relieved, I delved into hysterical laughter. I laughed so hard I cried and to this day, my DH tells me that he didn't know if I was crying from relief or pure happiness. You see, I come from a culture that uses coconut almost religiously. It's in our cooking. We break a coconut open at religious events. It's used in almost all sweets. It's in everything. The reason I was laughing was because of how much I hated one particular use for coconut. When I was a kid, pretty much up until I was in the 8th class, my mother would put coconut oil in my hair all the time. It looked greasy as hell. I hated it. And once I was old enough to start doing my own hair, I never put that stuff in my hair again. I was laughing so hard because, of course, I had a daughter with a severe allergy to the one thing I hated my entire life. We had a lot of fun telling people about her allergy and everyone laughed because they all knew about my hatred towards coconut oil. We told my mother and she laughed as well. She made jokes about how my baby must have heard me talking about my hatred for coconut oil while she was still cooking inside me and decided that she needed to hate it too. We all had a good laugh and left it at that. Or so I thought. My mother and I have always had a contentious relationship at best. We got along well enough, but we disagreed on certain topics. She wanted a traditional daughter who would be religious, get her MRS degree, marry a man that she and my father picked out, common where I'm from, have two kids, a house in the suburbs near her, and be a stay-at-home mom like her. I'm not religious in the slightest. I got two undergraduate degrees, went on to get a master's and a PhD, didn't get married until 27, late in my culture and I married a man who was the polar opposite of what my parents wanted. 
As if this wasn't enough, I was a working mom who didn't need her to babysit since my husband and I made more than enough for a part-time nanny. Essentially, the best way I could summarize our relationship is by saying that she was very proud of me and loved to talk about my accomplishments, but I could always tell that she wished I was something else. We have a fair amount of safe topics that we can talk about, but I could never discuss anything too serious with her such as politics or my career. Not because she'd get mad at me but more so because she just wasn't interested and I hate getting into conversations where I'm passionate about something but the other person could care less. As far as raising my kids, my mother was a just yes 99.9% .9 of the time. She was hands off and respected all of my decisions, even if she didn't like them sometimes. The only thing she continually got on my case about was the coconut oil thing. You see, my girls have very textured and curly hair. We don't really know where they got it from from, considering my husband and I have pinned straight hair that won't even hold a paper clip in it without slipping. I loved it. It was a little on the rough side and my mother always insisted that a little bit of oil would make the curl soft and more defined. I always said no. Sure, we could have used a different type of oil, but my girls were still so young and the allergy process had made me terrified of incorporating new things into their routine. I made sure I explained why to my mom too. She remembered what we had gone through with OD and her allergy. She brought me food and clothes at the hospital more than a few times. She helped me move all of my furniture and clothes out of my house when I was eliminating every possible source of allergen. She taught me how to cook from scratch when I was eliminating certain foods from the kid's diet. She knew everything about OD's struggle. To this day, I cannot understand how she did what happened next. November 2nd, 2005. I was giving a midterm that day to my students and I had to be at my research lab late that night. My DH was away at some conference and our nanny was down with the flu so she couldn't watch the kids that day. So I had my mom come take them for the day. My son was almost three years old and the girls were a year and a half old. Overnight visits with my parents weren't exactly common, but they weren't unusual either. They had always come back from these visits very happy and well taken care of, so I had no second thoughts about leaving them with my parents. They spoke to me on the phone after their lunch and then around 5pm we video chatted. The kids were also happy and healthy. I got home around 10.30pm that night and called my mom to see if the kids were up by any chance and I could say goodnight. I missed the kids by about 20 minutes. They had already gone to bed. So I talked to my mom for a little bit but she's a pretty early sleeper too so we hung up and went to bed. I woke up around 5am the next morning to go pick up my husband from the airport at 6. We were going to get breakfast together and then go pick up the kids. I picked up DH and neither one of us was very hungry yet. So we thought it would be a nice treat to pick up the kids first and go to breakfast with my parents. We got to my parents house at 7.45am. My parents weren't there. My son was at the neighbor's house and ran outside with the neighbor as soon as he saw his daddy and I pull up. He was hysterical and crying and I couldn't calm him down. My blood pressure was rising because now I'm thinking that something horrible had happened to my parents. The neighbor tells me that she isn't sure what's happening but there was an ambulance at my parents house at 6am and my dad had run over and woken them up to see if they could watch my son for a few hours until he got back. Of course they said yes. I'm calling my parents non-stop at this point and I'm getting frantic because I don't know what's happened. My son was still crying but he was calmer. He still couldn't really explain to me what had happened though. I honestly don't remember the details of what happened next but somehow we figured out that the ambulance was from X hospital nearby and we broke several driving laws trying to get there. We got to the hospital, pulled into the emergency entrance that was for ambulances only, left the car and bolted inside. A few nurses took notice of us immediately and were asking us what was wrong. I was calmer than my DH at this point so I explained that I didn't know but my twin girls and my parents were here somewhere. I'll never forget the look on that nurse's face. She knew exactly who I was in that moment and she was about to cry. Another nurse took me and my DH to an empty room and asked us to calm down and listen to the doctor before we went to find my family. My mother had put coconut oil in both my daughter's hair when they were playing the previous day before bed. The girls loved it when my mom did 
their hair and so they had asked for braids and my mom was doing their hair. She put coconut oil in both their hair because it would make for smoother braids. According to my son, OD started to get a little dizzy and itchy when my mom was doing her hair so my mom gave her some kids Benadryl which made her sleepy. Since it was close to bedtime anyways, the kids then went to bed. Giving her Benadryl was something we did whenever she had a mild reaction since it usually meant she accidentally came across some coconut from a secondary source. We also showered her from head to toe immediately to erase any lingering traces of it. My mother simply gave her some Benadryl and kept the coconut oil in her hair and put her to effing sleep. The Benadryl made her sleepy and unable to wake up or be conscious enough to wake up her brother or cry. She vomited in her sleep and the rash spread all over. Her little body was swollen to twice the size. She had asphyxiated in her sleep. She died painfully and slowly in the early hours of the morning. My mother had found her when she went to check on the kids in the morning around 7am. She was already dead by then. My mother screamed, called for my dad, and that's when they had gone to the hospital. My dad hadn't known about the coconut oil until my mom explained it and to this day, I've never seen my father so angry. He was still unable to look at my mother out of fury or me out of shame when I saw him at the hospital. They had rushed to the hospital hoping that there was some way to save my OD and to get my YD checked out immediately since he thought she might have a mild allergy as well. I can't even explain to you the emotions my DH and I felt. I remember seeing my little girl and just being in denial. There was no way that she was gone. This had to be a horrible, horrible nightmare. The following days, the funeral, and explaining to my other kids what had happened are events I still can't talk about because it just breaks a part of me. My mother was investigated as was my entire family. I almost lost my kids to my country's version of CPS once because they thought my kids were in danger. My DH and I had to fight tooth and nail to show that uprooting them during this time would be the worst thing for them at the moment. My mother was never arrested. My father did leave her, though they're not officially divorced. The majority of my mother's family refused to speak to her, and the few that do speak to her only do so on a limited basis. She currently lives on her own in a small town, and every couple months, I'll get a call from her telling me how sorry she is and how she just wasn't thinking and can I please find a way to forgive her. She wants to come see me. The only thing I can find to ever say to her is, you can come see me when you bring my daughter with you. It's been 13 years. Our son just got his license this year and YD is going to start high school soon. Both of them are healthy and they're turning into amazing adults, but neither one has been the same since OD passed. Our son is extremely protective of YD. YD used to be so bubbly and such a talkative little child, but she's quiet now. When she does speak, it takes some effort to hear her because she's so quiet. She told me a few years ago that she knows she was only a baby when it happened, but she feels incomplete all the time, like a part of her is missing. If it weren't for my DH, I don't think I could have ever recovered from the loss of my daughter. We have helped each other through the loss. It's taken over a decade of therapy to even get to this point. I don't know what I expect to get out of typing all of this out, but I've seen how much comfort this subreddit brings other posters, so hopefully I find some of the same peace. Thank you for reading. This post was created back in 2019 by user PSFI678 on r slash let's not meet. It's titled The Man on My Patio. Warning, long post but I recommend you read it all. Okay, so this happened when I was around 9 years old, 25 now, and it's something I will never forget. It gives me goosebumps to this day. I lived in a terraced house, meaning four houses combined, and my neighbors and I each have our own little patio. There's a small road 10 meters from my yard where people do their Sunday walks and so on. Only a small fence separates my small yard and patio from that road. I live in a pretty crowded area with several of those terraced houses spread around in my neighborhood, so seeing people walking on that road is pretty normal for me. Seeing random people standing on my patio is not. When I was 9, I usually got home from school about an hour before my mom got home from work. I live maybe 50 meters away from my school, so my mom figured I was mature enough to be home alone for around an hour before she got home. 
This one day, I got home from school. I did the usual thing, which was to make sure I locked the front door and double checked that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I was 9. Being alone was a little scary, even though it was in the middle of the day and only for one hour. I then rushed to my room upstairs to play as much PlayStation as possible before my mom came home and made me do homework. While playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. My room was located one floor over the patio, with a view to the road I told you about before. It was kind of like the sound of a cat, but my cat had been missing for over three months. Hope sparked and I thought, OMG, did he finally come back? I ran downstairs to check if it was my cat, but the sight that met me gives me goosebumps just writing this. There was a guy standing on my patio, a tall guy with black hair covering half of his eyes, making him look like a male version of the ring woman or something. I could hear him making high-pitched sounds, almost like a cat meowing. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth, and I could see him spitting out my dad's stomped cigarettes. He was actually eating from the ashtray. I was frozen observing this, eventually snapped out of it and screamed so loud that the man must have heard it. He didn't react, he kept on eating from the ashtray. I ran upstairs to my room, locked the door, and called my mom, who then called the cops. I've never been more terrified in my life. Laying in bed under my sheets, shivering with fear as I hear these creepy high-pitched noises from the guy eating cigarette stomps from the ashtray on my patio. I kinda blacked out for a moment because the next thing I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy, saying stuff like, what are you doing? Get over here or we will come down and arrest you, and so on. He didn't respond, but the high-pitched sounds was more frequent and louder. I decided to look through the window, feeling safe now that the cops were there. I could see two police officers standing by my fence, one man and a woman. I did not see the creepy man, however, because he was standing directly one story under me and out of my field of view. The police jumped the fence, and I remember hearing the creepy guy screaming louder than anything I've ever heard before. He charged the female officer with full force, and he effing knocked her out cold. The male officer then immediately tased the guy, leaving him shaking on the ground, screaming still. The policeman struggled to keep him on the ground while putting handcuffs on him, but eventually made it. After a while, he managed to wake up the female police officer, who seemed to be badly hurt. He called for backup and an ambulance, and then he sees me standing in the window above him. The expression on my face must have been something else because he just looked at me and said, I sure as hell hope you didn't see all that. I started to cry. By this time, neighbors started to arrive wondering what the hell was going on. One of my neighbors, an elderly woman, made me come down and she took care of me until my mom came back home. The police took the guy with them in the car and left. Before they left, they promised to come back and talk to us about what had happened. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. The male police officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. He explained that the guy on my patio was actually diagnosed with severe autism. He had escaped a facility where mentally challenged people lived, located around 5 kilometers from where I live. He explained that the guy had actually been living in my house 5 years ago, but he had been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in my house. He missed the routines and he missed living there with his mom. The police had to move him from the house that time five years ago because he was extremely strong. From what I heard, he had extreme tensions in the body because of the autism, making his muscles grow stronger and stronger throughout the years. This was the reason he reacted the way he did when the police came this day. Still frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure this would never happen again. He promised it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by and the guy didn't come back, until one year ago. At this time, my mom and dad had moved out. I bought the house from them and I'm still living there today. I was enjoying my morning coffee on the patio when I see this random guy stopping on the road by my fence. He just stands there, looking at me. I look at him and give him a nod and then I hear the high-pitched noises. Holy crap, it's him. His hair had turned gray, but the high-pitched sounds made me realize. My heart started racing and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. 
I realized that he must have managed to escape again. I started to realize how sorry I felt for the guy. 16 years later and he was back to look for his mom. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence. I started to think he would knock me out like he did to that police officer. He didn't. He smiled. He looked at me and smiled. I offered him to sit down. He didn't respond. I offered him to come inside. He started laughing. We went inside. His face lit up with pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had with his mom. It almost made me tear up. All of a sudden, he sat down on my couch, turned on my TV, and switched directly to the cartoons. I observed him for a while. He was just completely focused on the cartoons. I just wanted him to enjoy the moment, so I didn't say anything to him. I realized I had to call the facility to let them know. The caretakers arrived 10 minutes later. After a lot of convincing, he got back up, crying, and they went back to the facility. I called the facility two days later. We made a deal. His name is Tom, and I now consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday from the day he returned, Tom and his caretakers visit me to watch cartoons. They say it's the highlight of his week. It makes my heart warm. This final entry isn't exactly disturbing, but it's more so just straight up disgusting. It was created back in August of 2012. The story originated as a comment made on an Ask Reddit post, asking professionals what their most gory, disgusting, or worst medical experience was. The thread itself is pretty effed up, and we might take a look at that alone some other day. But the post that went on to be known as the Swamps of Dagobah went like this. OR nurse here. This is kind of a long one. I was taking call one night and woke up at 2 in the morning for a general surgery call. Pretty vague, but at the time, I lived in a town that had large populations of young military guys and avid meth users, so late night emergencies were common. Got to the hospital where a few more details awaited me. Pararectal abscess. For the uninitiated, this means that somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the Hole, there was a pocket of pus that needed draining. Needless to say, our entire crew was less than thrilled. I went down to the emergency room to transport the patient, and the only thing the ER nurse said as she handed me the chart was, have fun with this one. Amongst healthcare professionals, vague statements like that are a bad sign. My patient was a 314-pound Native American woman who barely fit on the stretcher I was transporting her on. She was rolling frantically side to side and most moaning in pain, pulling at her clothes and muttering Hail Marys. I could barely get her name out of her after a few minutes of questioning, so after I confirmed her identity and what we were working on, I figured it was best just to get her to the anesthesiologist so we could knock her out and get this circus started. She continued her theatrics the entire 10 minute ride to the OR, nearly falling off the surgical table as we were trying to put her under anesthetic. We see patients like this a lot though. Chronic users who don't handle pain well and who have used so many substances that even increased levels of pain medication don't touch simply because of high tolerance levels. It should be noted, tonight's surgical team was not exactly wet behind the ears. I'd been working in healthcare for several years already, mostly psych and medical settings. I've watched an 88 year old man tear a 1 inch diameter catheter balloon out of his penis while screaming, you'll never make me talk. I've been attacked by an HIV positive neo-Nazi. I've seen some stuff. The other nurse had been in the OR as a trauma specialist for over 10 years. The anesthesiologist had done residency at the level 1 trauma center, or as we call them, knife and gun clubs. The surgeon was ex-army and averaged about 8 words and 2 facial expressions a week. None of us expected what was about to happen next. We got the lady off to sleep, put her into the stirrups, and I began washing off the rectal area. It was red and inflamed. A little bit of pus was seeping through, but it was all pretty standard. Her chart noted that she had been injecting substances in that area. So this was obviously an infection from dirty needles or bad substances, but overall it didn't seem to warrant her repeated cries of, oh Jesus, kill me now. The surgeon steps up with a scalpel, sinks just the tip in, and at that exact moment, the patient had a muscle twitch in her diaphragm, and just like that, all hell broke loose. Unbeknownst to us, the infection had actually tunneled nearly a foot into her abdomen, creating a vast cavern full of pus, 
rotten tissue and fecal matter that has seeped outside of her colon. This godforsaken mixture came rocketing out of that little incision like we were recreating the funeral scene from Jane Austen's Mafia. We all wear waterproof gowns, face masks, gloves, hats, the works, all of which were as helpful as rain boots against a fire hose. The bed was in the middle of the room, in easy 7 feet from the nearest wall, but by the time we were done, I was still finding bits of rotten flesh pasted against the back wall. As the surgeon continued to advance his blade, the torrent just continued. The patient kept seizing against the ventilator, not uncommon in surgery, and with every muscle contraction, she shot more of this grey-brown fluid out onto the floor until, within minutes, it was seeping into other nurses' shoes. I was nearly 12 feet away, jaw dropped open within my surgical mask, watching the second nurse dry heaving and the surgeon standing on tiptoes to keep this stuff from soaking his socks any further. The smell hit them first. Oh god, I just threw up in my mask. The other nurse was out. She tore off her mask and sprinted out of the room, shoulders still heaving. Then it hit me, mouth still wide open, not able to believe the volume of fluid this woman's body contained. It was like getting a great big bite of the despair and apathy that permeated this woman's life. I couldn't effing breathe, my lungs simply refused to pull any more of that stuff in. The anesthesiologist went down next, an ex-NCAA D1 tailback, his 6 foot 2 frame shaking as he threw open the door to the OR suite in an attempt to get more air in, letting me glimpse the second nurse still throwing up in the sinks outside the door. Another geyser of pus splashed across the front of the surgeon. The YouTube clip of David at the dentist keeps playing in my head. Is this real life? In all operating rooms everywhere in the world, regardless of socialized or privatized, secular or religious, big or small, there is one thing the same. Somewhere, there is a bottle of peppermint concentrate. Everyone in the department knows where it is. Everyone knows what it is for. And everyone prays to their gods they never have to use it. In times like this, we rub it on the inside of our masks to keep the outside smells at bay long enough to finish the procedure and shower off. I sprinted to our central supply, ripping open the drawer where this vial of ambrosia was kept, and was greeted by an empty effing box. The bottle had been emptied and not replaced. Somewhere out there was a godless individual who had used the last of the peppermint oil and not replaced a single drop of it. To this day, if I figure out who it was, I'll kill them with my bare hands, but not before cramming their head up the colon of every last user I can find, just so we're even. I darted back into the room with the next best thing I can find, a vial of mastosol which is an adhesive rub we use sometimes for bandaging. It's not as good as peppermint, but considering that over one third of the floor was now thoroughly coated in what could easily be mistaken for a combination of bovine afterbirth and maple syrup, we were out of options. I started rubbing as much of this as I could get on the inside of my mask, just glad to be smelling anything except whatever slimy demon spawn we had just cut out of this woman. The anesthesiologist grabbed the vial next, dousing the front of his mask in it so he could stand next to his machines long enough to make sure this woman didn't die on the table. It wasn't until later that we realized that Mastasol can give you a mild high from huffing it like this, but in retrospect, that's probably what got us through. By this time, the smell had permeated out of our OR suite, and down the 40-foot hallway to the front desk where the other nurse still sat, eyes bloodshot and watery, clenching her stomach desperately. Our suite looked like the underground river of ooze from Ghostbusters 2, except dirty. Oh, so dirty. I stepped back into the OR suite, not wanting to leave the surgeon by himself in case he genuinely needed help. It was like one of those overly artistic representations of a zombie apocalypse you see on fan forums. Here's this one guy in blue surgical garb, standing nearly ankle deep in lumps of dead tissue, fecal matter, and several liters of syrupy infection. He was performing surgery in the swamps of Dagobah, except the swamps had just come out of this woman's butt and there was no Yoda. He and I didn't say a word for the next 10 minutes as he scraped the insides of the abscess until all the dead tissue was out. 
The front of his gown was a gruesome mixture of brown and red. His eyes squinted against the stinging vapors originating directly in front of him. I finished my required paperwork as quickly as I could, helped him stuff the recently vacated opening full of gauze, taped this woman's rear end closed to hold the dressing for as long as possible, woke her up, and immediately shipped off to the recovery ward. Until then, I'd only heard of alcohol showers. Turns out, 70% isopropyl alcohol is about the only thing that can even touch a scent like that once it's soaked into your skin. It takes 4 or 5 bottles to get really clean, but it's worth it. It's probably the only scenario I can honestly endorse drinking a little of it too. As we left the locker room, the surgeon and I looked at each other, and he said the only negative sentence I heard him utter in two and a half years of working together. That was bad. The next morning, the entire department, a fairly large floor within the hospital, still smelled. The housekeepers told me later that it took them nearly an hour to suction up all of the fluid and debris left behind. The OR suite itself was closed off and quarantined for two more days just to let the smell finally clear out. I laugh now when I hear new recruits talk about the worst thing they've seen. You ain't seen anything, kid. 